So you could just go along and sign up. But at the end of these two weeks, uh, we really need you to sign up so we can give you the links from the, for the Shirim. And I wanna say that um, the class today is dedicated for uh, the Refu Ashlema, for the health of Rabbi Jonathan Sachs, all the classes of today, all the English classes. Um, someone was uh, donated and wishes to stay anonymous, but wish that we all have him in mind and learn uh, with our schut of learning that uh, Jonathan Sachs um, um, will be well and have a Refu Ashlema. And I know that in your classes, Tanya, um, he was present a lot. Right, he was present Very in much. in the Torah that you. Those taught. of you that know me know there's probably not one class that goes without bringing a source of his. Right, so now let's have him, him in mind when we learn, and it should be a flash ma. And really, I wish all of you a lot of health, and hope to see you back here soon. But at least uh, we can meet in Zoom. So thank you, Tanya. Shana okay, I'll just say his name: Harav Yaakov Svi Ben Lieber. Um, and of course, everyone to take the name and also include him in all your tefillot. As I, as I wrote on my Facebook post, the world needs his voice desperately at the moment. And uh, we really pray that he has a refuah shlema. And I, I know from, as many of you know, my the last eight years, how prayer is not even just in a metaphysical sense, but in a very real empirical sense, prayer can have incredible power just the fact that you know someone is praying for you and I, I really believe in that I really really believe in its power both obviously in a metaphysical sense on high but also down here on low so everyone please have him in your prayers um, and with that thank you Oshra and I think I'll begin begin okay yes. so again it's absolutely fabulous I'm just looking through here and seeing so many of you Faye I can see Sorel hi and your mum is on right did I see her Vivian excellent I thought it was her I just needed to check okay amazing I'm with Faye hi I can see Sir Adele I, I mean I could go through everyone Rochelle. <laughs> there's so many of you and I it's I'm just so excited to see you all from it I can see um so I'm going to try, there's a couple of, we'll begin with a few logistics, and then I'm going to jump straight into our introduction and the outline. Oh, um, um, Oshra, Nikki's asking for someone to let Samantha in. I don't know if, uh, who's, who's, le who's letting people in, because I'm not, I haven't got it coming up on my screen. Oshra, any idea? Liat, are you with Rebecca. us? No, no, Rebecca's with us. I'm here, Liat, everybody's in. Ask, Rebecca, will you also put me as co-host I can share? You can share. Great, thanks. Okay, so just make sure you're letting Samantha in and whoever no, else but, I get. I think we cancel the waiting room. Rebecca, did you cancel the waiting room? No, I'm letting everybody in, everybody's She's in. letting everyone in. Okay, fine, fabulous, okay. Tom. Um, okay, so a couple of logistics. At the moment, we are up to 130 people on this Zoom, and I think there's more people coming in, which makes discussion very difficult. Now, as many of you know, who I've taught over the years, one of the key um, elements in my class is the idea of um, question, answer, and, and, and some kind of dialogue. Um, in my larger classes, for example, in Renana, it's obviously more challenging, but certainly in my smaller classes, um, that's really been <clears throat> the fulcrum of the class over the years. This is going to be a real challenge on Zoom. So, but having said that, I'm going to talk about this now in my introduction. I really believe that it's important that people bring um, questions or things that they need clarification about um, and even things that they want to say. So we're going to do it in the following way. I'm going to ask all of you that if during the class there is something, we're going to try it. We're going to, we're going to have to do a little uh, trial and error. If there's things during the class that you um, want to clarification about or have a question about, please put it in the chat. If there's something you'd like to speak about, uh, something you'd like to add, I'm going to ask you to hold off till the end. I'm always going to leave five to ten minutes at the end for people to... Um, 
to give over anything that they feel they want to add to the class, um, any discussion points. Um, so leave it to the end, put it on the chat at the end, or even at the end, I'll ask you all to open your microphones and we can have um, a short, small discussion between us. Okay, so I think that hopefully will be how it will go. Okay, so I want to begin by sharing my screen and just giving you a very, very brief outline of what we're going to be doing over the next year, how I envision the, um, the class to go. Uh, as you all know, um, and many of you who have been with me, it doesn't always go this way because we end up sometimes taking a um, going on in different directions. But for the minute, I really hope that we will get at least through certainly some, um, if not majority of what I plan. And I will cut things because there's some things I definitely want to touch on. And there's other things I think are less um, important for us um, if we're just focusing on, on, on this year. So, okay, hold on. I'm just uh, also, um, don't worry about turning off yet. And you can answer in chat. Exactly. Okay, thank you, Faye. Okay, so this was the this was the blurb that went with the course. I'm just going to read it for you so that those of you that are familiar with what we're going to do, you'll understand. As we face I'm just moving this, as we face an unprecedented crisis for humanity, many of us are asking how we continue in light of personal, national, and universal tragedy. The perennial question of evil and suffering and the particular challenge it poses for religion is not new, but in each generation, the responses shed a new light on our struggles, right? And this is essentially what I want us to do. The course is gonna be a journey through these responses to the problem of evil and suffering, okay? And it has, I mean, we could spend four years on a class like this, right? There are, if we're moving from the ancient times and through the philosophers and through the Tanakh and through rabbinic literature and through modern philosophy, it literally, I mean, basically it's what I've been doing my doctorate on, half of my doctorate on, the other half is postmodernism for the last, uh, three years this is my, now coming to the fourth year that I've been doing it but I've already been doing research on it for a long time so I'm saying it could take us a long time what I decided to do is to split it in two bite-sized pieces and as I always say and I say this from the beginning in all classes this is really an introductory class I it does not and it will not attempt in any way to be totally comprehensive it cannot be in the short time that we have together um but what I want us to do um is uh, the source sheets were sent, they should have been sent to you. If you don't have a source sheet and you would like one, I wonder if Rebecca, is it possible to put it on the chat, the source sheets? Um, okay, so- Does I'll Sue ask, have it? Sorry? Does Sue have it? Yeah, 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 Sue has I'll, both I'll the source sheets. There's the course me. outline and there's the introductory and the, she has them both. So if you can put it on, that would be great. If not, I'll do it at the end of the class. Okay. Um, okay, so I want to begin the first two classes, which are your free classes. Um, for those of you that haven't signed up yet, that's going to be an introduction to the course. It may tip over to the third class, but I'm hoping to keep it to two classes. And we're going to be looking at why is the problem of even uh, evil a problem at all? <clears throat> um, sorry, one step back. We're gonna have two introductory classes, which is not that, okay, which is an introduction to Jewish thinking and why um, Jewish thought is so important. Then we're gonna move on to unit one. In unit one, we're gonna be looking at the problem of evil and asking why is it a problem at all? And what I'm gonna suggest and what I believe is um, that it's really the basis of much philosophy, majority of, I would say, um, enlightenment philosophy even deals and grapples with this problem. And I would say also, even within Tanakh and rabbinic literature, we are always grappling with this theological conundrum of why, why is suffering happening in the world? And I would even suggest, and I have many times in the, over the years, that the first two or three narratives in Torah are grappling with this exact problem. We're going to address those narratives are going to address this idea of the centrality of the problem of evil and the centrality of what it means to suffer and what it means to find redemption. So that's going to be kind of by way of introduction. We're then going to move on to a very short um, class, one, one class, maybe two, where we're going to be looking at evil in philosophy. Now, again, it's absolutely impossible to do this in two classes. I'm going to do it on a very 
in a sense, I guess, superficial level. We're going to be looking at Plato, Aristotle, Aquinas, Leibniz, and Theodicy. Theodicy is going to be something major. We're going to define what that means and what it is. Hegel, Marx, Nietzsche, and existentialism. Those of you that know anything about philosophy will laugh at me when you see this and say, there's no way you can do that in two classes. You're right. There's no way I can do it in two classes. And we're going to do it anyway in two classes. The third is the problem of evil in Jewish tradition. Again, we're going to split that into Tanakh, rabbinic literature, and the problem of evil in the Rambam, because Rambam really deals with this. And, and I think he defines in many ways, most or majority of medieval philosophers that grapple with this problem. And finally, and this is really going to be the main element of what I want to be focusing on this year, we're going to look at the problem of evil in relation to the Holocaust. Um, now, you may think, okay, but these are, you know, very massive things, right? We're talking about the problem of evil, we're talking about suffering in the Holocaust, how does this relate to me on a day-to-day -day level? And, and in a very contemporary sense, maybe even ask the question, how does this relate to me today in the time of Corona? And you might say, well, we can't, how can we ever compare ourselves to what happened in the Holocaust? What I believe and what I really, um, I'm going to advance in these classes is the idea that suffering is a perennial problem for all of humanity and whether or not it is on the mass scale of the holocaust or whether it is on on the small scale of my day-to-day -day living has been assert in the last seven eight months and i really am finding it very difficult to function both of these are dealing or are grappling with human suffering yes there are obviously um, on different scales, on different levels. Okay, but the problem itself, the 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 intrinsic dilemma, or I should say, the philosophical dilemma, the theological dilemma, I think rests on similar foundations. Again, we're going to talk about this, and we're going to ask all of these questions. We're going to ask the question: Does the Holocaust pose a unique challenge to theos theology, or to philosophy, or to Jewish tradition, or is it just the same question that they dealt with when the temple was destroyed, or is it the same question that we deal with? when we face personal struggles or personal suffering. We're going to be addressing all of these questions and we're going to be looking at it from two different perspectives. The first perspective is going to be the Haredi, the, the Haredi and I call it the Dati response. It's an ultra-Orthodox response to the Holocaust, Holocaust, which says the Holocaust is not a unique problem. And what they do is they resort to traditional categories, okay, to categories of response that already exist within the tradition. And we're gonna look at a few of these particular um, responses. One is sin and punishment. Obviously the other is the idea of an eschatological vision, a vision of messianic a vision of redemption, where God comes and saves us and we don't need to take any human agency. That was essentially most of um, the, the paradigms that they used to grapple with the Holocaust. And many of these responses, by the way, wrote during the time of the Holocaust. The other response that the Holocaust is unique is a response that comes 10, a decade, if not two decades after the Holocaust. It's, it begins with Richard Rubenstein, who is a very well-known reform theologian who talks about the idea of God is dead. Okay, he uses Nietzsche's language, he speaks about the notion of God being dead, and he says that the Holocaust is a unique challenge to Jewish um, theology, and therefore we, the only way that we can conclude, having seen the absolute rupture that it created, is to say that God um, on a cultural, metaphorical level, doesn't exist anymore. Fackenheim talks about the 614th commandment, which is not to hand Hitler a posthumous victory. And we're going to look very much, Fackenheim is actually an incredible, Emil Fackenheim, an incredible philosopher. Um, Berkowitz, Eliezer Berkowitz speaks about the idea, and, and you'll all be, I'm sure many of you will be um, familiar with what he says, you know, don't um, blame man, um, sorry, and um, don't ask where was God, ask where was man. And he speaks about the idea of free will um, and the precursor, the, the, the notion of in order to be free individuals and have free will and have the ability to act as agents, God has to hide himself. I'm going to talk about that as well. Rav Soloveitchik, Kozo Dizofek, we're going to look at, and we're going to look at Rabbi Yitz Greenberg. Rabbi Yitz Greenberg, who I'm doing my doctorate on, um, I think provides a novel and very unique way of understanding the Holocaust. And we're going to grapple with all of these ideas, looking at the centrality of the problem of evil. So I'm going to stop the share now. So that's a basic understand, basic outline of how we're going to look and what we're going to look at this year. I want to begin 
um, with a preliminary introduction call, uh, introduction lesson um, and think about and, and introduce it in the following way. I really was thinking very, very, I thought this course was going to be very easy for me to, to, uh, to prepare. Hence, I chose it this year instead of carrying on this effort race year. I thought I don't need so I, I need to be focusing on writing. So I'm going to choose something that's going to be easy for me to prepare. I'm going to do the problem of evil, which I've been studying for the last three years, surely, and many years before that, surely this will be easy. And as I came to it, I realized actually it's impossible to create a course because it's so vast and so comprehensive and so enormous. How could I possibly be able to whittle it down to, to, to a few lessons over the year? Um, and so I began to think, how am I going to introduce it? Am I going to introduce it in a more philosophical way and ask the question um, about philosophy and Torah and the Bible? And is the Bible is the Bible a book of philosophy? I thought that's a little too academic because the responses are very academic. And then I thought, should I speak about the idea of introduction to Jewish philosophy? We could go through a time frame, understand where Jewish philosophy parallels general philosophy and understand all the different philosophers all, uh, along the way. And I just thought, you know what, that's also a bit dry, a bit philosophical. And we'll, we'll kind of touch on that as we go along. So instead, what I'm going to do is I'm going to introduce it from a very personal way, because for me, that's what Torah is about. Torah is about heart, touching the essence of our own struggles, the essence of our own personal journey. And I'm going to introduce it to, in a way that I understand the course. And that is, and, and, and by the way, when people ask me, remember once someone said to me, I don't understand, you know that there's no answer to your doctorate. So why are you even bothering to study it, right? You know that there's no answer to the problem of evil. And my response was, that's exactly why I'm studying it. I'm not studying it for the answers. I'm studying it for the journey, for the questions that open up more and more horizons. And I'm gonna talk about the notion of horizon shortly. And therefore, what I'm the way in which I'm gonna introduce the course is a journey on why thinking's important to me and why I believe that the Torah is not just a book of laws, but it's also a book of thought. And it's not a book of thought in the classic sense of a philosophy book. It, it doesn't come with propositions. It doesn't come with philosophical agendas. The Torah is a book about why thinking as a human being is the basis to living fully. So, with that in mind, we're going to move forward. I said, uh, Osha said to me one day when you're famous, well, I, I, I don't know about being famous, that's for sure. And I have no will or want to be famous, unlike some of my daughters, right? Um, but what I do, what I always argue with my brother about, he's in sales and he always says to me, you're not selling your product well enough. And I said to him, I've got no product to sell. What, what do you want me to sell? He says, no, people are out there. They're selling their Torah product. And I keep saying to him, he says, you've got to make them shorter, make everything you do shorter. You've got to put it into Twitters. You, you've, got to, you've got to make it very short and have it as like a, a cutthroat message that goes out there. And I struggle with that because number one, I don't think that's what Torah is about, firstly. I really, really admire people that are able to do it and people that can do it well, like for example, Rabbi Jonathan Sachs, right? He has managed to take incredibly complex things and whittle them down to 20 minute, you know, kind of videos. Again, they lose complexity. If you read his most recent book, for example, Morality, you'll see that you need a book to explicate the argument he's making in the most comprehensive way. There's no way you can do it in 20 minutes, but he has made a video about morality that kind of gives us the idea in 20 minutes. I'm not, I, I, I don't attempt to do such thing. Again, maybe one day, once I'm able to really be able to focus all of that and know how to do it perhaps, but it's not about the finished product and it's not about the finished idea and it's not about selling things. To me, learning is about living. It's about not about absolute answers. It's not about dead ends or quick and easy solutions. And this is exactly the key. In today's world, why does quick, I always call it quick Torah. Um, and by the way, there's people, Sivan Ravna is another example of someone who does it amazingly, right? There are people who can do it at a level that is phenomenal, right? But quick Torah, when not done well, 
is dangerous, right? Because it almost presents you with an easy answer, an easy solution, right? And it, what we lose is we lose the journey. And the journey to thought to me is the essence of our journey as human beings. And that's why, so, so I'm already kind of giving a, um, a warning, right? This class comes with a warning, right? If you want easy questions, easy solutions, simple answers, you're not in the right place, right? We're not gonna walk out of here, Chava, I can see you laughing. You're not gonna walk out of here with, um, you're not gonna walk out of here with easy solutions, okay? Um, if that's why you've come to the course, then I'm already given a warning, it's not going to happen. But what I do, what I really do believe, and, and this is really part and parcel of, of our learning journey together, is that we're going to climb mountains, steep mountains, tough terrains, all of those things that make a journey difficult, but also make them joyous and also make them redemptive and also allow us to learn about ourselves. I think that's also the key, right? When we go on a journey, it's about learning about ourselves what what can we what are we able and not able to do how resilient are we right how much are we allowing ourselves to open ourselves up to endless possibilities um and therefore this is what this class is going to be about it's going to be about a journey a journey in thinking a journey in sources a journey throughout the ages because we're going to be starting with tanakh and ending with post holocaust philosophers and contemporary um thinkers and in that journey we are going to feel frustrated sometimes um, and we are going to feel like hold on a minute you haven't really given me an answer you've asked far more questions than you've given any answers and I just want to say that I really believe that that's okay and not only is it okay I actually think that there's an element of um, God's will and I, and I say that with a little bit of trepidation um, in us doing that we're not animals we were given intellect and part of being a human being is to take that intellect and to use it in the best way possible. And today, more than ever, in the times that we are in, and let's be real here, we're in a pandemic, a global pandemic that is unprecedented. I don't think ever in the history of man, even when there have been pandemics, has it been this global. We are in the midst of something unprecedented. And all of us, every single human being on planet Earth at this moment, has experienced some kind of adversity in the last six, seven months. This is a mind blowing fact, and it's something mind blowing to think about. And therefore, perhaps this course comes exactly at the right time for us really to be using the skills that God gave us, which is our minds, which is the way we think about things, to build exactly that, to build resilience, to build redemptive moments, to find joy even in the midst of suffering or in the midst of adversity. So I want to begin in the following way. And it's, we're going to begin from a, from a strange place. We're going to begin with the idea of Shibim Panim Torah, with 70 faces of the Torah. Um, every year as I journey towards my class, this year I journey down to my basement. But as I journey towards my class, I, every year, and I say this at the beginning of every class that I teach, I always have this overwhelming feeling that I need to turn around and come back and go back right and it's I know you might call it imposter syndrome whatever you want to call it right I, I really sometimes I not sometimes it happens always at the beginning of every year it's like what am I doing right what am I doing how am I qualified enough to stand before class and teach Torah and I really genuinely um, feel that and I and it comes back during the year as well very often um, and the reason I think is because I look back and I look at the Godle HaTorah and, and, and I don't feel that there's any way that I should be coming and teaching you Torah in that sense. Um, but I also believe that teach, that learning, so, so, so I always say this, I don't, I'm not coming to teach, I'm coming to learn with everyone. We're doing a Chavruta, that's the kind of what makes me feel better. And I and this year it's a bit more difficult because I'm not getting that interaction, but um, I'm seeing a few chats. And I'm just going to log on is evil adversity. So that's a very, very good question, Stephanie. Um, yes, I can try and speak a bit slower. I apologize. I'm used to speaking very fast. I will try and slow down. Um, is evil adversity. It's an excellent question. 
And we're going to really be grappling with that. We're going to be grappling with the idea of what is evil. And is evil in itself, does it have essence? Or is it just the privation of good, right? Is it just the neg negation of good? Um, and does evil always equal adversity, right? These are very good questions. And they're questions that we're going to deal with and we're going to look at later, slightly later on when we look at the philosophical questions related to evil. Uh, Martin, belief in God is a mitzvah. If there were easy answers to questions of faith, it cannot be a mitzvah. We get reward because there are no easy answers. Okay, so it reminds me of your eye and it reminds us very much of what Eliezer Berkowitz talks about, the idea that if there was proof of God, right, um it would there'd be no mitzvah to believe in god meaning the the idea that we um do not have the answers right the idea that we have to think and we have to doubt or, or we do doubt right that's part of faith that is faith in fact okay rabbi Sachs also talks a lot about this so as i said i want to begin with the idea of 70 faces of the torah in order to make me feel better and in order to, I think, open us up to what this class is about. So Mo Moshe Alshech, the Alshech, who's also known as the Alshech HaKadosh, right, he speaks about, uh, he, he has a beautiful interpretation on Tihilim, Asher Priyo Yitem Bi'ito, right, the Pasuk in Tihilim, Bayake Eshetul HaPogei HaMayim, Asher Priyo Yitem Bi'ito, right, that its fruits are given in its time. And he says, Ki kol tam ah, hold on a second, I should share with you, apologies, one sec. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> Right? Every Tamid Chacham um, that plants his soul, so beautifully written, right? That plants his soul in the roots of Torah and that he is involved in day and night and that waters his soul. Okay, that literally sustains his soul. Right, he brings out these fruits and the fruits, the fruits are what bring the chidush, they bring the new ideas. Every soul according to how it relates to it, how it relates to the Torah. For so, Alken, in every generation, there are people who have been given the ability to bring chidushim of the Torah. Now, I'm certainly not one of those people, but what I hope is that I will be able to bring you the dayot of some of those people in our course. Okay, um, just one example, I think. You know, in recent years, women's voice have become much more dominant in the field of Torah study. And one of those women, for me, I'm not even talking here on the halachic element because that's not my field. But for example, Aviva Zornberg, Dr. Aviva Zornberg, right? Her writings, I think, have brought chidushim that, that, that over the years the, would, were not there. And there's something so profound about that. She brings something feminine to the text. She brings a feminine way of re seeing things to the text that only in this generation when women were lifted to become Torah scholars that they bring such um, chidushim to the fore. And I think it's really, really powerful idea. Okay? The chidushim harim, Rav Yitzchak Meir Rottenberg Alter, he was the first Gera Hasidic uh, Rebbe. He also says this similar idea. In every generation, there's a new understanding of the Torah that is right, that is fitting to that generation. And, and the Torah scholars of that generation, the tzadikim, he calls them, the righteous people, right? They know how to teach that generation what they need to hear. I believe more than ever, the generation that comes on the heels of the Holocaust, the generation that comes on the heels of, an, um, of the unprecedented modern state of Israel, has, there are, people that are Torah scholars and there are, and I would even say, right, contemporary modern thinkers who are bringing 
ideas that are matim l'dol, that are right for this generation, that are gen things that we need to hear in this generation. A generation that has never before had to stay a modern democratic state, that has never before seen the destruction of six million of their own. That generation needs Torah to speak them at a in a certain way at a certain level. And if we just keep the old paradigms and we don't renew and transform and look at things in a new way, then we're not doing what these two great good Hadar have told us to do and told us what the Torah gives us, the gift in a sense that the Torah gives us. And here I bring Rav Yoshua Heschel, who I bring, and this is a source I bring every single year because I think it's one of the most beautiful sources about opening up ourselves to new ideas in the Torah, which is what our course is always about. And he says as follows, irrefutably, indestructibly, never weary by time, the Torah wanders through the ages, giving itself with ease to all men, as if it belonged to every soul on earth. It speaks every language and in every age. We all draw upon it and it remains pure, inexhaustible and complete. In 3000 years, it has not aged a day. It's a book that cannot die. In fact, it is still at the very beginning of its career. The full meaning of its contents have hardly touched the threshold of our minds, like an ocean at the bottom of which countless pearls lie, waiting to be discovered. Now, that analogy in my mind is so powerful and so beautiful, right? Every generation has to travel to the bottom of the ocean to uncover those pearls of wisdom, right? And that exactly goes hand in hand with what we've been saying about this notion of a journey, right? It's not easy to get to the bottom of the ocean and uncover those pearls and open them up, right? It's not an easy journey, but think what's there at the bottom of the ocean. Think of the wonders, of the awe, of the amazement when you get there. And that's really, to me, what it's about. The Gemara in Chagida says as follows. The Gemara asks, if so, derive the following from the same analogy. Just as the scope is movable and not rigid, so too matters of Torah are movable in accordance with circumstance and are not permanent. Therefore, the Torah states nails which are permanent. Okay, there's a discussion here about what one can move and can't move. The Gemara further asks, if so, one can explain as follows. Just as this nail is diminished and side does not expand as it wastes away over time, so too matters of Torah are gradually diminished and do not expand. Therefore, the verse states, well fastened, natuim, just natuim from the word lintar, which is to plant, right? Just as this plant flourishes and multiplies, multiply, so too matters of Torah flourish and multiply. Those are composed in collections by Leia Sufot. They, these are the Torah scholars who sit in many groups and engage in Torah study. Now we know the Gemara always takes various psukim and then has a discussion on what it means. And very often that discussion brings um, analogies or metaphors to explain what the psukim may, um, may mean. Okay, um, there are often debates, okay, and they talk about this idea of us support being Torah scholars sitting together. And they say there's often debates among these groups. Some of these sages render an object or a person richly impure, and others, these render them pure. These prohibit an action, and these permit it. These deem an item invalid, and these deem it valid. Lest a person say, how can I study Torah when it contains so many different opinions, the verse states, they are all given from one shepherd. One God gave them, one he de Moshe said from the mouth of the master of all creation. Blessed be he, as it is written, and God spoke all these words. The plural form words indicates that God transmitted all the interpretations of Ten Commandments. Since the sages invariably utilize the Torah itself or the statements of the prophets as sources for their opinions, there is certain unity to the study of the Torah, despite the numerous explanations and applications. So you, the student, make your ears like a funnel and acquire for yourself an understanding heart, an understanding heart. Okay, to me, that's a fascinating expression. That is emotional intelligence, right? An understanding heart. My, way before we understood what emotional intelligence was, right? To hear both the statement of those who render objects ritually impure and the statements of those who render them pure the statements of those who prohibit actions and the statements of those who permit them, the statements of those who deem items invalid 
and the statements of those, it's got cut off, I apologize, who deem them valid, okay? This is amazing what the Gemara is telling us here. Okay? The Gemara is giving us today, I think, a message that we need to hear more than ever. Okay? I'm gonna stop share while I discuss this source. Um, it's giving us the message today of the danger of clinging on to my own truth at the expense of hearing the truth of others. It is true, says the Gemara, that at the end of the day, yes, in Halakha, we have to have one, one, one answer, although the Gemara doesn't even say that to us at this stage. It says it's come from one source, right? But because we're human and we're fallible and we're limited, we have the gift and it's a gift of subjective interpretation. And subjective interpretation means that I may see something as pure and you're gonna see it as impure. I may see it as valid, as mutal, and you're gonna see it as in invalid, as a soul. How do we manage that dissonance? How can we, in a world in which there are people with differing opinions, right? How do we manage such a thing? So there's a very well-known um, philosopher or sociologist, I think he might be, Robert Putnam, got his book upstairs it's called bowling alone he wrote the book in 2015 um and it's uh, rabbi Sachs talks about him a lot as well and it's a book about how in america people used to go bowling right that's that used to be they used to all go together in groups and now lots of people go on their own and he said that represents this idea of isolationism of individualism taken to its nth degree right taken to its extreme and he argues more recently in, in 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 the last year or two he's argued about the idea of polarization and he has said that america has never been since the time of the civil war has never been as polarized as it as it has been today okay what's this got to do with the Gemara? because i believe that and by the way we're seeing it today in israel right it's it's happening to us today right and and whether that's because um, of what's going on during Corona, but I believe it was an underlying sentiment that already existed and Corona has just brought it to the fore. Look at the polarization that is happening within our own country, right? And I really think that this notion of polarization, what is it about? It's about seeing the worst in the other, right? It's Micha Goodman, a very well-known Israeli, uh, Israeli philosopher, thinker. He speaks about the idea of polarization as being a collapse in curiosity. What does that mean? The minute I don't, I'm not interested in listening to someone else, and in America, it's specifically political, right? I, I, I'm not interested in listening to someone who does not have the same political view as me. I only listen to Republican chat shows. I only listen to Republican thinkers. I only read Republican articles. I only buy newspapers that have articles that align with my political views. The name of the author of Bowling Today, Diana, what is uh, Robert Putnam. Robert Putnam. Um, I only buy newspapers that have my own political views. This is what leads to polarization. And he says polarization is when I lack curiosity. I've lost curiosity. I'm not interested. I'm not curious about the view of somebody else. If we think about the Gemara, the entire Gemara is, being, is about being curious about the view of someone else. The arguments that ensue within the Gemara, the different opinions that come about, all of it is about, and not just that, it's not just that someone says this and someone says this, they have to bring proof for their argument they have to show us where that argument is they have to go back and, and and bring all the precedence to that argument this is curiosity this is when we've opened ourselves up to the opinions of others right um the torah by the way has also become subject to the this notion of um polarization or, or we could even call it monopolization right um it's become monopolized by every group every group takes the torah takes it inside, holds it to themselves and says, this is mine. And I, only I have the right way of interpreting it. Right, Rav Benny Lau tells this incredible story that I for sure, um, Matty, openness as opposed to the cancel culture, which is taking over American progressive 
curiosity, the cancel culture. Motti, you want to explain? Matty, sorry. I know what you mean by the cancel culture. Okay, yeah. if, if you yeah. want to unmute yourself. Ah, yeah. Matty, yeah. Uh, well, let me open my camera. Uh, the, the, uh, in, in the States now, the the, there's a movement on campus and among all intellectual um, thinking as part of the progressive culture that says, I don't want to hear it. So if uh, somebody, a right-wing speaker is invited to the university, uh, can, yeah. they, they cancel him. Yeah. Maybe for Alan Dershowitz speaks about that and, and others. Uh, so there's no further discussion. It's what you were saying, the echo chamber, of this is where I am, this is all I want to hear. A hundred percent. Thank you, Matty. Yeah, for sure. I tell you who else speaks about that. Um, Jordan Peterson speaks about yeah. it a lot, right? And he he's been unfortunately the victim of of, of this uh, in many places. Rabbi Sachs, by the way, speaks about it in his book Morality. He has like four or five pages where he speaks specifically about that idea. Um, and I'm gonna talk in a minute because I think this is the result. And and by the way, it's the liberals who are the ones that perpetrate that right but they do it in the in the name of liberalism and it's obviously the opposite of liberalism and this is where we've really this has led down to the roads of polarization not a quite not a question rabbi benny Lau gives the most beautiful story of why he one, one of the reasons he created 929 is because um he went into a, a Chiloni school and um he went into the class and as a, as kind of an introductory kind of joke or whatever he took the Tanakh and he says oh I found this in the corridor who does it belong to and all of the class start burst out laughing they were like not me not me like why would it belong to one of them the Tanakh and he said at that moment he they said and one of them one very innocent girl he said like he knew it came from the point of innocence and not from the point of um of chutzpah she turned around and she said that belongs to someone's ati there's no no one's ati here in the school right um oh uh sharon you've just shared your screen for some reason i'm not sure how that happened but if you just want to press stop share um not to someone not to not to us and he said at that moment it suddenly struck him that for the majority of people in israeli society they believed and they felt that the Torah was the domain of the Dati, and that it didn't, it was monopolized. It had been monopolized by the Dati people. And at that moment, he said, I need to bring Torah back to the masses. I need to bring Torah back to the, the, the person in the street. And that's why he found it 929. I think it's a beautiful story. In Gemara Shabbat, right, we, it, it talks about this idea of cracking open our world. And, and I'm just gonna share with Amar Rabbi Yochanan, I'm just gonna share again, hold on. Um, where are we? Okay, Amar Rabbi Yochanan, my dictive Hashem Yitenome Hamifsarot Sabah Rav. Kol Dibor, and that comes from a Pasuk in Tehillim, where Hashem, um, Adonai Yitenome Hamifsarot Sabah Rav, right? That the women playing the tidings are a great host. It's interesting, it comes from the voice of the women. So the way in which the Gemara understands this verse is that, all, what, what does it mean? It means that the word of Hashem, right, was thrown into 70 languages. Like a hammer that slams down and breaks up a rock. Ma patish there. Okay, and this is a very well-known motif in um, rabbinic literature of the word of God being in 70. 70 represents infinite in some ways, languages, right? That the word of God um, is, is being divided into infinite languages. And again, what, what the Gemara here is saying to us, and, and it's very reminiscent, by the way, of that beautiful Agada in, in, I think it's in Tamud Shabbat, that talks about the idea of Loba Shamayim, right? That when um, Hashem was creating the world, they were all arguing, all the different midot were arguing between themselves, peace and truth and all the various midot. And in the end, Hashem takes truth and he throws it down to the earth and it shatters, right? And, and the pasuk that they quote is, 
that truth grows from the land, right? To me, that, that motif of taking truth and throwing it down in order to create the world, this is exactly what we're talking about. When I possess and own the truth, when I believe that my truth is the only truth, and my truth is a truth that has to be stuck to fundamentally at the cost of someone's life even, right? At the cost of destruction, right? That my truth is the only truth. That means I'm monopolizing the truth. That means that truth hasn't been thrown down to land and shattered and growing up in all different spaces. It means that truth is still in heaven. And I believe in my arrogance that I own that piece of truth in heaven. And that is dangerous. You cannot have a world. The world can't be created with such an attitude. It can't exist because if it does, there's no shalom. And that was the argument in heaven. The argument in heaven was between Emet and Shalom. It wasn't between Emet and Shechel. It was between Emet and Shalom. Because we cannot have peace amongst us if we are polarized. Polarization is when I own the truth. I believe in my truth so fundamentally that I will fight to the nth degree and I will cause death and destruction in order to protect it. Um, again, I know that there'll be many of you that will ask, um, hold on, yes, it is said 70, but not more than 70. What does the Torah say about ha how to have many interpretations? Hold on, I'm just gonna, um, without having interpretations that are not meant to be. Okay, so this is exactly the question I was about to say that obviously we're gonna ask, right? How do we know what is, and again, if we're going back to the motif of truth growing from the earth, how do you know what's a weed and what's a plant? And any of you that have ever gardened will know that weeds grow looking like the plants that they grow next to in order to fool you, right? It's quite an amazing thing. I only discovered that once we planted our own garden. And this is a problem. And we don't have time today to go into it, but we will maybe perhaps um, touch on this as we go along the way. One thing I will say, however, is that I believe that the search for truth is a life journey. And I believe that if we, um, if we come to it from a place of humility and not hubris, I'm going to talk about this as we continue. If we come to it from a place of humility, if we journey along that journey, recognizing that we are limited and we are fallible, and perhaps the truth that we think is truth is not truth, then the world would be a totally different place. Okay? And that is what I believe. I believe that, yes, we're not always going to know whether something is true or not true, whether our interpretation is right or not right. And maybe we have to ask the question, does it have to be right? Right? But maybe time only time will tell and maybe at the point where we recognize no it was actually wrong that requires humility in order for us to recognize that our truth might not be right we also have to be open to the fact that we have no monopoly on truth okay and that is the key here so i want to um i want to um talk about the idea of let me just go back a second right okay the thing about, so to go back to polarization, polarization means I'm living in my Alba Amot. Now, again, more than ever today, why is polarization, why are we seeing it during Corona, I think, even more? Because no one is leaving their homes. No one is leaving their computers. And our computers, those of you that have watched The Social Dilemma, and I really, really um, urge you to watch it. It's scary watching, but it's very important. Um, okay. Uh, Okay, hold on, I can see a few chats. I'm gonna to come to the chats in one second, okay? Um, I urge you to watch it. In The Social Dilemma, what it shows us is even though we think that we have all the information at our fingertips, what we're being shown on most of social media are algorithms that are showing us only the things that we wanna see. So if we have certain views and opinions about things, we're gonna be shown articles that align with those certain, certain views and opinions. So where we think we have the world at our fingertips, actually we don't, okay? And that is, in some senses, um, creating an environment whereby polarization is even greater, okay? Um, I want to just speak for a second about this idea of growth, what growth means. And growth is exactly this idea, and it goes back to the question that, I can't remember who it was, that asked about this notion of truth. Yes, it's true, we may, we may believe that we've interpreted right, we may believe that we own the truth, 
but part of living is growing. Part of living is expanding our horizons, is saying, hold on a minute, what I thought to be the horizon as I journey towards it actually isn't the horizon. And that, to me, that notion of the horizon, the offect, right, is really, really important. So much so that in, in the introduction to my to my paper, which I've kind of half already written, I speak about this idea of the horizon. And I wanted to share with you something. I'm not sharing it on the screen because I don't I don't want to share it with people right now because it hasn't been published or sent or given in. But I'm just going to read to you what I've written because I think it's such an important idea for us today. The task incumbent on us as human beings is to expand our horizons while concurrently viewing the horizons of others. Okay, and this is the key. The horizon is the point at which I see no more, but know that there is more. When we talk about expanding our horizons, that's exactly what it is. It means, yes, at this particular moment in my life, that's what I see, but I have to recognize that there's more to it. It's the point of mystery, for I know not what lies ahead, but, also, but it's also the point of humility, because I know that my vision is limited. And hence it forces me to acknowledge that others too have their own vision, their own horizons. It literally opens me up to the potential of new possibilities, new possibilities and new visions of horizon. Nietzsche in his famous God is Dead passage, and this is fascinating. What does he say? He says, how could we drink up the sea? Who gave us the sponge to wipe away the horizon? What he was intuiting, I believe, is that in killing God and making ourselves master of the universe of our own destinies, we created the tools for our own demise. And this is what is happening today. Nietzsche, in some sense, has prophesied what was going to be today. We wiped away the mystery. When we said God is dead, we wiped away the horizon, as he said. We wiped away the mystery. We claim to promote progress, openness, but we obliterated the possibility of doubt and humility. So convinced of our own infallibility, we fail to see the horizons of our own visions and perhaps even more dangerously, those of others. I'm not one for imposing meaning on a reality that is halfway through and that we don't really understand. And I'm talking here about Corona. But one of the things that Corona has done, without a doubt, is to force us to see that what we thought was the, was the horizon isn't. It's forced us to face our own fallibility as human beings, right? We thought we knew everything. We thought that science and medicine and everything we knew was the beginning of new horizons of, of things that we were in, totally in, on top of, totally in control of. And what it's forced us to recognize is our own fallibility. The sad part is that instead of recognizing that, fundamentalism has taken its place. Why? And that's to do with fear. That's to do with the fear that factors into our human experience of adversity. And this is gonna be at the point, this is gonna be at the, uh, at the basis of everything we're gonna be looking at in terms of the problem of evil and in terms of suffering. So what I really, really believe, right, that we need one of the major things that the Gemara teaches us, one of the major things that rabbinic literature comes to teach us, and obviously I totally believe the Torah comes to teach us, is this idea of housing within us different, differing opinions in order to harbor humility, fallibility, and also growth. Growth can't happen if I'm stuck, if I think that this is the only box in which I place myself. Growth has to happen when I'm allowed to encounter varying horizons. Before we go to the next source, I'm just gonna look at the various, um, shame to Morty, shame to hear that, that exclusivity of opinion, not listening to the other. I have to hear that the right speaks truth and the left is intolerant. Okay, I'm not sure 100% understand, but let's let's go at the end, let, um, open your, at the end of the class, we'll go back to it. The source sheet on the chat is the only outline. Oh, um, Rebecca, if you're still listening, can you add the introduction sheet as well? um to the chat i sent to sue both um rbs always listening to the other even they differ from her stance um ruth yes 100 percent. that there's some amazing stories about her amazing about ruth bader ginsburg where um she, also her friendship with various people who had totally different political views 
and she maintained that relationship between them. Shoshana Rav talk, talks about truth and Sheker that Adam and Chava had in Garden of Eden. They wanted more. They knew there was more good and evil. They wanted to feel desire. They sacrificed utopia and immortality, yet they learned humility. A hundred percent. Just but it's already posted, by the way, that someone who asked about the chat sheet. Just by the way, I was reading I, literally when I was reading when I was hearing Kriya Hatorah this week, I just saw something so phenomenal in that story of Gun Eden. I know if we've got we don't have so much time to, to talk about it here. I don't even know what the time is. Oh no, my time's up. Uh is it? What time do I have till? Does anyone know? Do I have till 10 or 10:15? 10 10 20. 10 10. 10 10. 10, 10. 10. 10. Great. Okay, good. I, I, we'll come back to the Garden of Eden because I think there's something fascinating. I'm just going to point out, and I'm not going to give my interpretive view on it, but I just want to point out to you that what is so fascinating is that the word, because I was looking where the word ra comes up the first time in Torah, bad, evil, or whatever you want to, however you want to define it. But the word tov comes up before she eats from the tree. She sees that the tree is tov le'enayim. And then only when she eats it, she eats from the tree of uh, of, of good and bad, Tobara, only after she eats from that tree does she um, have knowledge of Tobara. So how did she have knowledge of Tov before she ate from it? And what I want, what I really believe is that there's a, a, a very big difference between superficial, between one dimensional recognition of good as being aesthetic good and good being moral good. Good being moral good and good being aesthetic good. There are two very differing things. And I'm going to say the same for evil because that's the element of our class. There's a very big difference of something being aesthetically bad and something being morally bad. I'm going to talk about both of them. Okay. I want to share with you um, the source of um, David Hartman. Have I David Hartman? I'm really sorry. I'm just looking for someone outside my window here. It's a bit odd. Okay. Um, okay. He says as follows, there's a beautiful metaphor in the Tosefta that describes the kind of religious sensibility that the Talmud tried to nurture. Make yourself a heart of many rooms and bring it into it the words of the house of Shammai, the words of the house of Hillel, the words of those who declare unclean and the words of those who declare clean. In other words, become a person of whom different opinions can reside together in the very depths of your soul. Become a religious person who can live with ambiguity. And this is another essential element, I think, I believe, to be fundamental to our modern conscience, to, to, to our ability to be moral people today in our modern world, to be able to live with ambiguity, who can feel religious conviction and passion without the need for simplicity and absolute certainty. These are such important words for us to hear. In this type of interpretive tradition, awareness of the valid, of valid, validity of contrary positions enhances rather than diminishes the vitality and enthusiasm of religious commitment. So while the law may be decoded according to the views of one teacher or school of thought, alternative views are not discarded as if falsified, but are retained and studied and may even become the law at some later date, right? Do you ever think, why do we need to know about that writer or that Tosefta or the opinion of this one or the opinion of that one? Why do we even need to know the opinion of Shammai if we follow Hillel, right? Because it's and and the, and the Gemara tells us that in what in the days to come we're going to follow the opinion of Shammai, meaning there's still a truth. Shammai owns, possesses an element of the truth, right? It's just not a truth that we are able to adopt at this moment in history. Okay. Um, this then is the distinctive legacy of the Talmudic interpretive tradition, an understanding of revelation in which God loves you when you discover ambiguity in his words. He loves you for finding 49 ways to make this pure and 49 ways to make it impure. Revelation is not always pure and simple, but may be rough and complex. And we even say that there's a distinctive sense of humor that typified the classic Jewish tradition, a sense of humor and therefore humility about your certainties about what you believed could not be otherwise. In all my years of study with uh, Rabbi Joseph Soloveitchik, I never once heard him call someone a heretic or dismiss a soundly argued opinion as illegitimate. You argued, you discussed, you disagreed with intensity, but you understood that you were defending a human point of view, not the final word of God. And even then, according to the Midrash, we would not hesitate to reprimand God for exceeding the limits of divine authority in the domain of halachic debate. Revelation gives you the word of God, but the interpretive strategies necessary for implementing that word are not in heaven, right? And that refers to that famous Agada Lobesh right? I think there's something very beautiful, and, and David Hartman's 
by the way, is called a heart, a room of many hearts, right? There's something beautiful here that he talks about the notion of humility. Humility is the key to growth. It's hubris, right? Doesn't acknowledge my limitation. Hubris says, I know everything. I'm, I'm, I'm totally infallible, right? I only have my vision. But we need to sustain the gap, that dissonance, that gap between what I know or what I believe and what is. And by the way, that gap between the ought and the is is also the gap where we have a problem with the problem of evil. The problem of evil resides, okay, Susan Nyman, who we're going to come across a bit later, she's a, a, a philosopher, Jewish, she happens to be Jewish, but she's not a Jewish philosopher, she's a philosopher, and she talks, a lot of her books are focused on the problem of evil, and she talks about the idea that the basic problem of evil is between the world that I believe ought to be and the world that is, and it begins from a very young age. In fact, Winnicott talks about it as when a child starts teething, right? The world as I believe ought to be is a world without pain, is a world where I go onto my mother's breast, I suckle at her and everything's fine and dally, dilly. But when the child starts teething, all of a sudden the world isn't as it ought to be. The world is. Teething is part of growing up, right? But it's not a reality that the child believes ought to be. And that dissonance between, and then obviously as a child grows old, they come home from school, this teacher did this to me, it's not fair, right? And, and, and yes, that's the way the world is. There is unfairness in the world. It's not the way we believe the world ought to be. And that gap, that, that chasm between the ought and the is, that's where the problem begins, okay? And if we bring God into the picture, it becomes even, the chasm becomes even greater because the God that we believe ought to be is a good God, is a God that chose the Jewish people, is a God that protects us, is benevolent, is omnipotent. And how can it be? that such a God would allow for such extreme evil to happen in the world. So this is all comes together with this idea of what is and what ought to be. And I think that this notion of possessing within me varying opinions is the beginning of our journey towards understanding the problem of evil, to recognize that perhaps we are not as infallible as we believe. And that we need a sense of humility in order to grapple with this gigantic problem that we are facing of the problem of evil. Okay, I want to, I, I see I literally only have two minutes and um, I'm going to finish with one final source by someone called Ariel Berger. Um, okay, it's a new book which I was recommended by someone in this class. Um, called Witness, and it's, um, he, was a, he was the um, student, student kind of um, helper um, for Elie Wiesel. And he speaks about Elie Wiesel's methodology of teaching, but he speaks about that, that lots and lots of other things. It's a, it's a really great book, I really recommend it. He says as follows, rather than collapse the distance between us, between our world views and opinions, we need to sustain the gap. Okay, and this is exactly what we've been talking about, that gap between what we believe and what others believe, okay? Um, in this way, we serve as helpers against friendly antagonists, partners in clarifying our thoughts. Many of us spend so much moral energy in promoting connection, but we sometimes forget to truly celebrate dif difference. Okay, this, is, this is what um, Wiesel speaks about. We profess that all human beings are familiar to us. We claim to be so comfortable with different people, religions, ethnic groups, languages, skin colors, face shapes, that we no longer see them. There's a certain kind of jaddedness when it comes to such tolerance, when it comes with such tolerance, nothing surprises us anymore. And it's difficult to respect what you do not see. Just as he helped us to see one another with fresh eyes, Professor Wiesel helped us to see familiar literature anew. For students who grew up reading Genesis in church or synagogues, the challenge was to help them forget what they thought they knew. One of our jobs as educators is to help students forget what they know so they can stay alert to the text nuances and this goes back to what we said at the beginning about the idea of curiosity right of engendering curiosity in 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 the world again 
Wiesel's conception of the battleground demands that we shed the armor rather than use it for protection. Any typos and, and grammar mistakes are mine. I, I typed, I didn't take it from the book. I typed it myself. So they're all my mistakes. When we studied the biblical story of David, he pointed to a powerful moment in the text. David on his way to fight Goliath was given the king's armor. For a battle this unequal with the life and day sex stakes, armor makes sense. But David removed the armor for it didn't fit him. The image for it didn't fit him. The image has stayed with me as a symbol of a key concept. The, that vulnerability is the greatest weapon if you're brave enough to use it. And here we're going to move on next time to this notion of vulnerability when it comes to addressing texts in the Torah and when it comes to addressing the idea of thinking. But I really believe here that what, what Eli Wiesel is, is that one of the keys to what Eli Wiesel is telling us here is, and, it, and it's amazing because he was way ahead of his time in the sense that he's saying to us, yes, we live in a world today where liberalism, okay, is going to take a path that is going to lead in the, in the end to fundamentalism. Why? Because the liberals say, let's accept everyone as they are. Everyone is equal. Everyone is the same, right? John Lennon, imagine the world, imagine no religions, imagine no boundaries, imagine everyone being the same. But what's the problem with that? When everyone is the same and we refuse to see people's differences, we have nothing to learn from them. We have no curiosity. We have no humility. And ultimately what happens is that I... I, I, I kind of move people away. I shun people away if, there's, if, if we see that in the end, they're not the same as who I am. The key is to maintain difference and to maintain humility and to say, I know that I believe this to be my truth, but not at the expense of the truth of someone else who may also possess an element of the truth okay and 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 so to go back to where we began um when we were talking about the idea of of, of the journey that we're taking the shivim panim of the torah is one of the strongest messages okay one of the strongest messages today to us on the notion of humility and fallibility on the idea of maintaining difference of maintaining differing opinions but at the same time of standing strong in what I believe, I believe the Gemara, I believe the Torah tradition is something that shows us that that balance can be done, that we are able as human beings to house within us many different hearts, many different voices, many different opinions, and yet still stand strong on what we believe. And perhaps it's a lesson today in the world of, as we said, polarization that we need to hear more than ever. I'm going to stop now and I'm going to go to the chat. Um, I know where I left off. Uh, oh, my goodness. Uh, okay, rough from Ram, meaning unstable. Is that someone did someone just yeah. say want to say something? Yes, I want to clarify the comment I made earlier about shame. It's more in lead words. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. In other words, Martin made the point that the uh, liberal left is intolerant, and you agreed with it. And that's the point that I have a problem with. I don't think it's appropriate, particularly in terms of what you're trying to teach us this morning. I did. Okay, I'm going to just, I'm just going to stop. I didn't say everyone on the liberal left is intolerant. I totally don't believe that. And I, I don't think that's true at all. What I said is that there are varying groups within the liberal left that have become intolerant. Of course, I don't believe that everyone on the liberal left is intolerant, absolutely not. Okay, that I just wanted to clarify that, but yes, continue. No, no, that was my only point. In other words, not to say that the left is intolerant. In no, 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 hundred percent. You're hundred percent right. No, no, I, I believe that, the, 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 that in both both on the left and on the right, there are groups, there are factions within both elements that have taken fundamentalists and extremists, taken their views to a fundamental end or to extremist ends. And that's what we have to be careful of because the minute we take our views to the point whereby we've built up barriers and we've built up um, a, a box around us that we don't see the view of anybody else and we don't, and, 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 and there's no 
humility in what we think and there's there's no fallibility to our views that's where the danger begins but as you said 100 percent right there's many many phenomenal people on the liberal left who are totally embrace the notion of differing opinions and various other things and progress social action and and, and that's phenomenal um so yeah i 100 percent. sorry i should have um, been made that clearer um okay i thank you all for your comments i think we have to finish um we have to finish. Matana Sharon says we have to finish. Thank you all for coming. It has been phenomenal to see all of you. I really, I'm like going through again, looking at all your wonderful faces. And I so appreciate you all being here. Um, please join me again next week. We will be continuing with these source sheets, hopefully coming to the end of them, understanding this journey, and then we'll be jumping straight in to the problem of evil. Thank you all. Thanks. Take care. Have a wonderful Thank you, Tanya. Weekend. It was wonderful. Thank Bye. you. Bye.